It is Wednesday, December 28th, 2022, so it is the last Wednesday of 2022, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in Genesis chapter 30 tonight, so I hope you can join me in Genesis chapter 30 by getting a Bible ready. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you've joined us this evening, and we also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We're getting back into our pretty new study of the book of Ephesians, and and then join us at 1030 for worship as well. And if you have any questions about class tonight, any feedback, any comments, anything you want to talk about or special prayer request, uh, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And we would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, I am in my study on the southwest side of Madison right now, and I'm actually recording this on Tuesday afternoon, even though this is supposed to be live streamed, uh, scheduled to go out at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Right now it's about uh, almost 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon and I've been doing this for a few months now so that I can uh, go and share this with my dad on Wednesday morning about 9 o'clock as soon as he's uh, done with breakfast. So I tell him that uh, this is one of the great privileges in having a son who's a preacher. He gets to see the Bible class uh, before anybody else does. So he will have beat you to it by a number of hours but if the Lord wills this uh, recording will go well to Tuesday afternoon. I'll share that with him Wednesday morning, then get that uploaded to YouTube and uh, ready to go out uh, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. And I, I guess I could let you know it's a little bit cold in here in my study, and uh, most of you know that we heat with wood at our house. And uh, obviously all of us know that heat rises and my study is in the lower level of our home. And uh, so it's a little bit cool down here, just barely feeling my fingers here. It's almost like hiking, a little bit like the outdoors. Uh, but I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to be together in this way, at least together in a sense. Especially with so many of us spread out being so far apart geographically, we have members in Belleville to the southwest and Portage and Rio up to the northeast and then Arena to the west. We've got members up in Lodi to the northwest, all the way down to McFarland to the southeast, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some and maybe farther away from that who are members of the church here. But we have guests joining us regularly online from as far away as Kenosha, right here in Wisconsin, about an hour and a half, two hours southeast of here, as well as several down in Illinois and Texas and New York and Ohio and maybe other places as well. But uh, where, wherever you are, we're very glad that you're with us tonight. And if you found us on YouTube, we'd appreciate it if you could subscribe to the church's YouTube channel. That helps to get the word out a little bit more. That way you uh, may able, uh, be able to get a little better updates as to when things are going live. Tonight we are back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings uh, written by Moses and we're now looking at the life of Jacob. Jacob has pretty much tricked his brother by taking the birthright. And Jacob is now on the run from his brother Esau who has vowed revenge. His solution to this problem is to, to uh, simply kill his brother. And Jacob at this point has now found a wife in Haran, two wives actually, <laughs> long story there, but we've looked at that the last few weeks, so he's ended up with Leah and Rachel. And uh, the way we left it last week is that Leah, the one he loves the least, is actually the first to start bearing children. But Rachel, the wife he loves the most, is barren. She is unable to have children. And by the time we get to the end of Genesis chapter 29, Leah has given birth now to four sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. So to try to help us keep track of the 12 sons and the one daughter that uh, were all born to Jacob, I've made a chart that will hopefully help out a little bit. We'll get back to this in a few minutes, and I'll share this a number of times through our study tonight and over the next few weeks as we try to keep this stuff straight. Uh, but for now, I've put the first four sons born to Leah up here. These are the ones that are in black print. I've put the others kind of faded out. I put them on the chart just so they're there, but uh, just kind of holding the place. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but for now, the first four sons born to Leah, we talked about this last week, and those who have not yet been born, they're up there in light blue. So again, th at this point, we've got Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah all born to Leah. So in the, in the race to have children... Uh, Leah is way out ahead at this point. So these are the four sons of Jacob, and this brings us to uh, Genesis chapter 30 tonight. So again, hope you're with me now in Genesis chapter 30, and the first paragraph is verses 1 through 13. Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 through 13. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister, and she said to Jacob, "'Give me children, or else I die.'" 
Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She said, Here is my maid Bilhah. Go in to her, that she may bear on my knees, that through her I too may have children. And so she gave him her maid Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore she named him Dan. Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, How fortunate! So she named him Gad. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, Happy am I, for women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. So again, Leah has had four children leading into this chapter. Rachel is now starting to get jealous. Jacob loves her more than he loves Leah. But Leah's obviously getting some loving, and she has four children of her own. Rachel has none. So Rachel, therefore, seems to get mad at Jacob. And so she confronts him in verse 1, Give me children or else I die. And what a, we've talked before, what a messed up family situation. We're going to see that again a number of times tonight. Jacob is angry. Uh, he puts this back on God, blaming God for this. In other words, Jacob knows, you know, he's doing his part, so the problem has to be with God. That's probably from his point of view. So Rachel, therefore, proposes a workaround. She suggests that Jacob have relations with her servant Bilhah so that she may bear children on Rachel's knees. So that's kind of the custom in that day where a servant would maybe bear a child for a master and would place the child on the master's knees, kind of, we would say, in his lap. And that would be uh, indicating that that was indeed the, uh, the, the child belonging to the master of the house. Kind of wonder where she got that idea of sending a maid in to have relations with your husband when you weren't having children yourself. Well, obviously, this is almost exactly what Sarah had suggested to Abraham uh, many years earlier, isn't it? That she, uh, that uh, her servant Hagar go into Abraham in a similar way here. And we know that issues uh, were introduced in the family at that point, as well as into the world for the rest of history. However, we don't always learn from the mistakes of the past, do we? Sometimes uh, we try to take shortcuts or we try to look for workarounds to get around God's will for our lives. But Jacob agrees to this. He takes Bilhah as his wife. And they have two children, Dan and Naphtali. Dan goes back to a word meaning vindication, as Rachel feels somewhat vindicated. And Naphtali is tied to a word uh, meaning wrestling, indicating that Rachel feels as if she has wrestled with her sister and prevailed. So not really the best names for children, not really the best attitude to have here. Oh, I got her now. I had a, had a couple kids through my servant here and I've won. I've come out on top. Well, this, however, merely escalates the war of children between these two women. Leah sees that uh, she has stopped bearing. She's afraid she's going get to get, get behind here. And so she does with her maid Zilpah what Rachel did with her maid Bilhah. And Leah has Jacob take Bilhah now as a wife. And they have two children between them, Gad and Asher, meaning fortunate and happy. Kind of a different attitude between those two sisters and how they're naming their children at, th at this point. So just bringing us up to speed on the chart here, we've now added Dan and Naphtali, born to Rachel's maid Bilhah, as well as Gad and Asher, born to Leah's maid Zilpah. I kind of struggled with the order on the columns. I don't know if you're paying attention to that, but... Uh, I thought about putting Rachel first since she was the favorite. That would make sense, uh, certainly. But I put Leah first since she is the older sister and also especially since she's the first to bear children. So that's the order that I put these in. I uh, kind of also struggled with the order of Bilhah and Zilpah. I kind of thought about putting Zilpah next to Leah since she is Leah's maid or Leah's servant and Zilpah next to Rachel since she is Rachel's maid or servant. But I ended up putting the women in the order of the first to bear children, uh, the order that we read about these births in the text. And I labeled the maids as to which woman they were serving. Leah and Zilpah go together, uh, as do Rachel and Bilhah. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps in some way, even though the servants are not right next to their masters on the chart, if we want to put it in that way. But I did put them in the order that they bore children. Uh, but I do think the chart emphasizes how Rachel is really falling behind, isn't she? She's really feeling left out. She's feeling rejected uh, in this family, rejected by Jacob and, and certainly rejected by God himself. And obviously, 
um, having multiple wives is not the ideal. That's not the way it was set up in the Garden of Eden. But once people left God's plan, God seems to have regulated this and uh, trying to bring some peace into, into a, a quite chaotic situation. But uh, let's just keep that in mind as we go forward that uh, polygamy is certainly not the ideal situation here. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 30 verses 14 through 21. Genesis 30 verses 14 through 21. Now in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, therefore, he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. God gave heed to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has given me my wages, because I gave my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good gift. Now my husband will dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons, so she named him Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. Well, up in verse 14, we have a reference to Reuben, uh, the firstborn. Reuben uh, finds some mandrakes out in the field. He's obviously not a toddler at this point, I wouldn't imagine. Some time has gone by. He brings him back to his mom, Leah. Well, Rachel, not having any kids of her own, uh, really seems left out here. And if you can't have kids, if you see children bringing their mom gifts all the time, uh, I'm thinking that that would be absolutely just heartbreaking. Everybody's getting stuff for Mother's Day, we might say, and you get nothing. So Rachel then asks Leah for some of the mandrakes, and Leah just explodes. Obviously, a lot of pent-up anger, uh, frustration at this point. You've already taken my husband, now you want my mandrakes. And, you know, you kind of see how that argument's going to go. So Rachel, therefore, suggests a trade. <laughs> You give me the mandrakes, and I'll let my husband sleep with you for the night. So we're kind of seeing the arrangement as it's going on here, the way things are working in this family. And I know, again, we've talked about this being one messed up family, and we see it again here, don't we? Uh, but it seems then that Jacob was in the habit of sleeping with Rachel. That was his customary, um, you know, that's the way things were normally done. This is his normal living arrangement. Um, but in this case, Rachel makes a trade. So kind of behind the scenes, wheeling and dealing, give me these mandrakes in exchange for my husband. Well, we've had some other bad deals in this family's history, haven't we? We think about Esau trading his birthright for a bowl of stew. And, and maybe in a similar way, Rachel trades her husband for some mandrakes. Must have really wanted those mandrakes. So, or maybe she just wanted a night away from her husband. <laughs> you know, Some of you would be willing to... Uh, trading your husband for some uh, for some mandrakes. Uh, but mandrakes, by the way, as I have read it and researched just a little bit, are a part of the nightshade family. They're harvested for their roots, kind of like uh, carrots, uh, parsnip kind of thing. And uh, the roots sometimes take on almost a human form, almost like carrots. Uh, in our garden this year, I got a carrot that almost, uh, almost looked like a little orange person coming out of the ground there. And there are some weird legends, some weird tales tied to mandrakes. They are uh, known as something of an aphrodisiac. Um, they are thought to help with fertility. Um, they supposedly scream when you pull them out of the ground. Um, think Harry Potter here, if you're familiar with that. Uh, one ancient custom suggests tying the root to a hungry dog. Okay, so you dig down beside the root, you see the bottom of it, you tie a string around it, tie the other end of the string to a hungry dog, and then you run away from the dog and the mandrake while covering your ears, and, um, and so that, that string will jerk the root out of the ground, and the plant will kill the dog, not you. Okay, so that's like one theory from medieval times. This is how you harvest mandrakes safely so you don't hear them scream and they kill you with their scream. Okay, I'm just saying there's some weird... Uh, tales, some weird superstitions tied to the mandrake going back to ancient times. Uh, but here in this passage, Rachel trades her husband for Reuben's mandrakes. And in return, Leah has Leah, not Rachel. Leah has two more kids, Issachar and Zebulun, meaning wages and gift. So Leah now has six sons of her own, and she also has a daughter uh, named Dinah. So I'm just saying the aphrodisiac fertility root goes to Rachel, but it's Leah who actually has the children, if that kind of tells you anything. Kind of an interesting switch up yet again. So just bringing us up to speed on the chart here, we've now added Issachar and Zebulun. 
as well as Dinah, all born to Leah. And uh, I didn't give Leah, or I, I didn't give Dinah, rather, a number. And not because she's unimportant. She is important. Uh, tragic situation is going to happen later in uh, the book of Genesis. But I didn't assign her a number simply because we normally think of the 12 sons of Jacob. We normally don't think about the 13 children of Jacob, but we think of the 12 sons of Jacob. And I just wanted to keep the birth order among the sons straight uh, by numbering the 12 sons in the chart here. So just uh, didn't want to leave Dinah out, but that's why she doesn't have a number by her name. But I wanted to make sure that we get her on the chart as having been born to Leah. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 30 verses 22 through 24. Genesis 30, 22 through 24. Then God remembered Rachel, and God gave heed to her and opened her womb. So she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. She named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord give me another son. We might be tempted to credit the mandrakes, but remember, um, Moses attributes what happens here not to the mandrakes, but to God. God opens Rachel's womb, and she conceives and bears a son, naming him Joseph, meaning God will give. So we got the first reference to Joseph now. And so it's almost as if she names Joseph in hopes of having another son. So it seems like a good attitude. Maybe the attitude has changed just a little bit here, though. But uh, in her mind, Rachel has been remembered. Uh, God has taken away her reproach, and she now has a son of her own. So again, just bringing us up to speed on the chart here, we've now added Joseph as the 11th son and the 12th to be born. And you may be able to see Benjamin down there grayed out in a bit uh, on the uh, lower right-hand corner, but we aren't quite there yet. But just wanted to point out he is there on the chart. He's coming. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 30, verses 25 through 36. I almost thought about cutting this chapter in half. This is kind of starting a new, uh, new chapter, almost, even though it's in the same chapter. But uh, Genesis 30, 25 through 36. Now it came about when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served you, and let me depart. For you yourself know my service, which I have rendered you. But Laban said to him, If now it pleases you, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. He continued, Name me your wages, and I will give it. But he said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your cattle have fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? So he said, What shall I give you? And Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today. Removing from there every speckled and spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be according to your word. So he removed on that day the striped and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one with white in it, and all the black ones among the sheep, and gave them into the care of his sons. And he put a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Well, Jacob now has twelve kids. And with twelve kids and four wives, Jacob realizes, i got to get out of here. You know, he needs this place, he needs a place of his own. He needs to get away, he needs some space. Kind of remember the, the situation between Abraham and Lot, how it got too crowded and somebody had to move. So he approaches Laban, he basically suggests, you know, I've worked hard through the years. Basically, as I understand it, the 14 years is probably up. It doesn't say it in the text here, but that's probably where we are now. And so he's saying, please consider me paid up. I've, I've done my deal. I've, I've done my end of the bargain that we had many years ago. And, uh, and, and consider this the end of it. Just let me leave. But Laban, though, scheming fellow that he is, tries to get Jacob to stay and wants Jacob to name his price. Whatever it is, let me know. We'll, we'll start there. So Jacob, though, reminds Laban that God has blessed Laban because of Jacob. You know, basically, you had almost nothing before I showed up, and now you have increased to a multitude. And now Jacob wants, wants a chance to head off and kind of make a name for himself, do this thing on his own. Laban wants to know what he can give him, and Jacob makes an interesting suggestion. 
I will take out all of the speckled and spotted sheep and every uh, and every black sheep from among the lambs as well as the spotted and speckled among the goats and that'll be my wages. So normally, as I understand it, a shepherd might be paid with a certain percentage of the flock, maybe 20% or so. In other words, I'll care for your flock, but I get to keep 20% to either eat or sell so I can make a living. That's kind of the way shepherds were paid back then. And so it kind of seems that we have something similar going on here. Uh, Laban has this huge flock that has absolutely flourished under Jacob's care. And uh, Jacob says, you can pay me by letting me keep this pretty small percentage of sheep and goats from the larger flocks. I'll take those that have these rather unusual characteristics. And I think we kind of know this today. We think of sheep, most sheep are white. We think of goats, most goats are kind of darker in color. And it's more unusual to have a multicolored sheep or a multicolored goat. And so Jacob is saying, as I understand it, kind of to keep us honest, I think he's probably saying, we're kind of both known for scheming and cheating and, you know, trying to worm our way around here. So instead of saying this one's yours, this one's mine, number off, one, two, one, two, one, two, like you do in gym class, instead of doing something like that or branding them or something that could be faked, um, you just have all the solid colors. And I'll take this tiny percentage over here that are multicolored, that have speckles <clears throat> um, in, uh, in their coats. Well... Um, what we'll see in the next chapter, God had suggested this to Jacob in a vision. But at least for now, we have the suggestion that Jacob take this little tiny percentage of the flocks as payments. And it kind of, it sounds good to Laban. I mean, after all, I'm looking out at this huge flock and this all of my herds, and they have these characteristics now. And what he's asking for is a pretty small percentage. And I'm assuming that this percentage will continue over time, that it'll be consistent. And so this sounds good to him. Uh, some have suggested, and, and I can't really, it may be different translations would be clearer on here, but the last couple of verses of this um, suggest that Laban kind of steals some of the multi-colored animals and takes them away and hides them before Jacob can get to them, that that's what's going on. I don't really see it in that way. We have some... Oh, it's not really perfectly clear here who does what, but that's not the way I would take it. I, I would take it that uh, they divide up just as was proposed. And so Jacob is now uh, watching over all of these flocks, but he knows that a certain percentage of them are his, these with these uh, particular characteristics. So let me know if you have another uh, understanding of this. Maybe I missed something here, but let's conclude tonight with Genesis 30 verses 37 through 43. Genesis 30. 37 through 43. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. He set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs, where the flocks came to drink, and they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks brought forth stripes speckled and spotted. Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban, and he put his own herds apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rods in the side of the flock in the gutters, so that they may mate by the rods. But when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in, so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So now that Jacob is something kind of off on his own, at least a little bit, a little distance there, three days away, if I understood that correctly, uh, with his own flocks, he gets busy. So he has many years of experience as a shepherd, but as I said earlier, we'll find out in the next chapter, God is absolutely a part of this and is actually tipping the scales in his favor. But he takes these poplar and almond and plain tree sticks he strips the bark in a particular way. He puts these sticks in the watering troughs as the flocks come to drink and as they mate. And I will admit, I really don't know what's going on here, at least at this point. This is all strange to me. Uh, again, we do have more information coming later in the next chapter. But for now, some have suggested he's making some kind of medicated tea. So he's stripping off the bark and letting it soak in the, the water that these flocks are drinking at a particular time and when the strong ones are there. You know, it's kind of strange to me. But ultimately, though, as we learn later, God is responsible for what happens. Uh, just as he's responsible for Leah having children before Rachel. And so the bottom line is Jacob's flocks and herds, they grow stronger. 
and they grow at a much greater rate than Laban's flocks and his herds. And God is behind this. So this brings us to the end of Genesis 30. Um, in terms of practical application, I think we see the danger of favoritism within a marriage. We see the danger of polygamy, having multiple wives. And certainly that was never God's plan from the beginning. Uh, but his plan is for one man and one woman to be together for a lifetime. That's God's ideal going all the way back uh, to the Garden of Eden. And uh, anything beyond that gets very complicated in a hurry. And we've absolutely seen that in this chapter. So next week, we come back together to look at chapter 31. And we'll have a better explanation, I think, of what just happened and some communication between God and Jacob leading up to it. Uh, but with that, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for being with us. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. Again, we're still pretty early in our study of Ephesians. So this would be a great time to jump in. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly. And don't forget to subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel, uh, share the class tonight on Facebook, invite somebody to that group. Any way that you have of sharing what we're doing together as a congregation certainly would uh, be very helpful. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even in a far-off land, you can see that Jacob was being taken advantage of by an evil man, and you found a way to start making these things right. And so we understand tonight that you are a God of both love and justice. And tonight we pray for the wisdom and courage to follow in your footsteps. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.